I knew even when I started to do act one, because five months turned into five years. <laughs> Right, and it went from Flint is Family, the photo essay, to Flint is Family in Three Acts, a five-year book that is a testament and is a toolkit to teach you how to get access to your own free, clean water. And so I said to Elle and Hearst, look, there's an act two here. We deserve uh, to show Americans that it's not simply this uh, uh, poor black working class people in Flint. Flint's got multi-million dollar cul-de-sacs, Everybody was not on the Flint River water. People were on Flint Township water, which is what GM was switched to when it started eating their engine parts as well. So let's not confuse the general public here. There's a much more complex, nuanced story. Anyone I wanted to do this second act about this photograph and this spring hit and the fact that she's going to inherit 90 acres of land in the South, where her family was not enslaved, that land was always in their family, Nobody wanted to cover that story. I couldn't get an editor or any of these magazines to run that story, those photographs. It took me uh, two years after I made them to get them out to the general public, and it came through an exhibition at SF MoMA. And to me, that's the hidden narrative. That's right. We want to keep teaching America and the general public to keep the mentality that black people were enslaved, black people are poor, you know, all the people in Flint are poor. That's not true. They were middle to upper class. The real question is the slow violence, right? What Rob Nixon calls this concept of slow violence. I am more concerned with that because it's when you're contaminating the water, the soil, the air, you're privatizing the water, you're cutting down our, our education system, privatizing that. Like these are the violent acts that are happening systemically every single day. But photographers aren't given an opportunity to create images to challenge it. And so that's where it shifts into uh, me having to find these hidden narratives and why I called the particular chapter on Shay and Zion leaving Flint and returning to Newton, Mississippi that I produced all on my own. That's where the hidden narrative comes in. And when people see them, they see these images of Zion sitting atop a Tennessee walking horse on her 90 acres of land that her, father, her grandfather saved for her that she's gonna inherit, that she's a survivor of the Flint water crisis, like that's where the power is. And I think that's what people are afraid of because right. then you have to change the way you've always thought. And then it makes you deal with your own implicit bias and prejudice. And so I'm always trying to gently and quietly do that for everybody who engages my work. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to love on you through my photographs to show you something that does impact our own humanity when we're not aware of all of these other things, and we are duped through politicians and corporations into believing these binaries that are simply untrue or are false facts right. or benefit from certain types of omissions. Yeah, I mean, it's no accident, right, that it was hard for you to bring those photos forward and for mm -hmm. magazines and others to accept them because you're changing the gaze, you're changing the story of who these people are, as long as you can present them as these poor sort of black people and perhaps filling in other stereotypes, then you see them as undeserving of, mm -hmm. of, of good, clean water. You talk about, yes, the photos you take, but if you've spoken about the photos that you don't take. In particular, I remember speaking of Zion, where you said that you saw her at the water fountain in her school that, uh, and well, and it said you can't, don't drink from this fountain, it's contaminated. It reminded you of the uh, water fountains uh, of a day where white only, colored only, mm -hmm. and you can speak on that. But you also said you didn't take that photo. Mm -hmm. And so, when is justice served by not taking a photo? And how do you make the decision to find justice in the absence of taking a picture? That's a powerful question. Thank you for digging that one <laughs> out. Um, you know, that moment was a, it was a teaching moment for me. I was following uh, Shay's daily schedule, 
And so we went to pick Zion up from the Flint Academy School. And um, there were, were the fountains, and she was giving me a tour of her former high school as well, and I saw the fountains. And it just hurt me. Like, it just hurt me in my core, in my gut. And I just knew I, I, couldn't, I couldn't make an image because I didn't want that to live. Like, sometimes images li just live in your mind, right? We see in pictures. We don't see in words. So we have pictures. And I think that our mind is a battlefield for images. And the way we internalize those images dictate how we feel and think about ourselves and see the world and our humanity. So there's a war that's constantly going on with me, you know, in my mind and in my spirit about images. And I have this conversation. There's a choreography and a organizing around all of the images that I made. And so that was a teaching moment that crystallized for me. And I realized, no, I'm not going to give them what they want. I'm not. I'm not going to create that image that says that. Not this time. What I'm going to do is create this one, the one you see here, which was after five years of me being in Flint. I didn't realize it until this very moment. I had never seen those children playing with water. That was the moment. Hmm. And it was Amber and Shay and all the little kids running in the water as Moses was turning on the atmospheric water generator. Like, I, I chose not to hmm. give the fountain, but to make that, because that image is poetic justice right. to me. Right. Because what is actually happening around that photograph is that it was a photographer, an inventor, you know, these black working class women who you know, are dying from their terminal illnesses. Both Amber and I have battled lupus our whole lives. She was battling cancer as well. Her grandmother had passed right when we made that image. So it was serious mm -hmm. pain and suffering happening for us. But yet, <laughs> I decided it was time for poetic justice and to switch from the black and white to the color to capture this beautiful color image of them being gleeful and happy and playful, which we hadn't really seen in each other for those five years that we endeavored to do this work. I stopped taking photographs in order to switch hats. I'm more than a photographer. And when I am making my work, I'm not making it as a photographer or a photojournalist. I'm making it as a concerned citizen and a human being. And I'm trying to write new testimonies and stories, real accounts that document these types of systemic abuses, but also at the same time show triumph in ways that everyday people like us, in spite of what corporations and governments and policymakers do to us, that we can still rise above it and that we could do it collectively, collectively. When we were at that machine, it was people who were Christian, Muslim, atheists, scientists, doctors, artists, gay, straight. It was everyone who came because we wanted to get people access to free, clean water. It wasn't about all the isms that divide us. It wasn't. And the fact that we were able to do that as this like rainbow coalition and the media would not show up to interview right. us and document right. it, I said, all right, I'll switch my hats from philanthropist to activist back to documentarian, and I will document everyone coming up and interviewing them at the machine about their health bills, their water bills, what it's been like getting water from the machine so that I could then disseminate that through a book to all of you so that you can read it and see, like, this is actually what happened. It's not what the media showed you. They gave you a fraction that was really uh, manipulated in a way that dealt more with what our media in this country does, right? Uh, the media is owned by six conglomerates. That's it. So if you think you're getting unbiased news, you're kidding yourself. Six conglomerates control all our media. They are all white and then I think one Asian because of Sony. So just think about that for a second. It doesn't matter if you go from MSNBC to CNN or to Fox. It's the same people controlling the stories that you want to tell yourself. And I'm saying to all of you, all you got to do is go out there and talk to people yourself as a citizen and, and find out what's going on or listen to artists like me when we bring forth these counter images and narratives that show you like, no, you're in the media. They're simply serving the elite and the tastemakers of our society. And I'm saying, what is the inverse of that? 
and I have it for you in the work, which is you tell it in a grassroots way from the bottom up, from the people who are at the intersection of all of these calamities. That is what you deserve. That is what we deserve as Americans in this country.